Tonight, we are very excited to welcome Mallory O'Meara for her new book, The Lady from the Black Lagoon, Hollywood Monsters and the Lost Legacy of Millicent Patrick. When O'Meara, a screenwriter, genre film producer, and co-host of the weekly literary podcast Reading Glasses, wanted to learn more about Millicent Patrick, the woman who created the Gilman costume for the eponymous creature from the Black Lagoon, she came up empty-handed. Knowing only that Patrick had been one of Disney's first female animators, she set out to discover the rest of the story, along with why it wasn't better known. Her book profiles a fascinating, talented woman whose achievements, when not overlooked by men, were often claimed by them. O'Meara's compelling detective work restores a valuable chapter to film history and also suggests that there's much more about women's roles in the film industry we still have yet to discover. So please help me welcome Mallory O'Meara. I want to thank you all for your patience. I'm on book tour right now. I don't know what dimension I'm in. I went to a different location and I walked in there and it was like my worst nightmare. I was like, there's no none of my books. They don't know who I am. And then I went, oh no. Uh, so before I get started, I just want to let you all know I'm not going to be doing readings. Uh, I don't like doing readings. Uh, so I am going to talk to you all about Millicent and I want to be in conversation with you. This book is a book that really invites conversation. Uh, if you've how many have started reading or read it at all? All right, so some of you know that this is not a normal biography. Uh, and if, how many reading glassers are in the audience right now? Hell yeah. <laughs> That's what's up. Okay, uh, so if you don't know who I am, if you don't know what this book is all about, Millicent Patrick is my hero, and she designed the creature from the Black Lagoon, and I found out about her when I was a teenager, and I'm a huge monster nerd, as you can tell by looking at me from, like, I'm five miles away. <laughs> and... No one else in my family likes horror, so I really had to teach myself. I didn't have a parent or older sibling or something to show me all the cool stuff. So what I did was I taught myself. I started watching all the classic Universal monster movies, Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, who's my husband. And I got to Creature, who's the last one. And I watched it. I fell in love with it, even though it's a you know it's from the 50s. It's black and white. It's kind of cheesy. I still think it holds up. I'm obviously extremely biased about this. Uh, and I loved it. So I did what all nerds do. And I went online and I wanted to find out behind the scenes photos, trivia. I want to know how that suit was made. And in amongst all the things I saw, you know, pictures of the of the mask and facts about making the movie and shooting it underwater and all that cool stuff. There was a picture of a woman working on the monster suit. And I had never seen that before. Not only had I never seen a woman working on a monster suit, I had never seen a woman working on a horror movie. I had never seen a woman working on a movie, any movie. And it was like being struck by lightning. Up until that point, I really was very happy with being a, a monster fan. I still am a monster fan. But I never thought, hey, this is something I can do too. All of my heroes in that world, Rick Baker, Tom Savini, Dick Smith, Jack Pierce, they're all dudes. They're all dudes dudes and I'm not a dude. And so it just never occurred to me that that was something that I could do. And when I saw this picture of Millicent, it was like my brain exploded. I thought, oh my God, I could do this. And the caption for the photo said Millicent Patrick, illustrator and designer. And that was it. She was just this big magical floating question mark for a really long time. And I looked and looked all over the internet back then. There wasn't even a Wikipedia page about her. And there is one now, I don't suggest that you read it unless the Wikipedia magical goblins have fixed it in some way because it's full of errors the last time I saw it. And I didn't feel like fixing it because I felt like people had to buy the book if they wanted to get the good stuff. So I just left it up there. But back then there was nothing. There was like a few blogs and like one weird article on some sci science fiction website. But there wasn't anything, you know. And the reason for that is that so Millicent designed the creature. And when Universal Studios decided, hey, it's time to promote Creature from the Black Lagoon, they were looking for all kinds of wacky ways to promote the movie. And one of the less wacky ways was, hey, we have this woman who designed the creature. She's beautiful. She's captivating. Why don't we send her on a press tour to promote it? And it will be the beauty who created the beast. Great. Awesome. Cool. This was a time when Millicent was the only woman who had ever worked in a makeup shop. She was the first woman to do any of this. And also, no studio had ever sent a character designer, a creature designer, or even a makeup artist on tour to promote a movie. So this was like revolutionary, awesome stuff. Except Millicent's boss at Universal was a man named Bud Westmore. And 
I have lots of opinions about Bud Westmore, as you will find out. But Bud Westmore didn't like people knowing that he wasn't doing the design work. He really, he headed up the monster shop. He was part of the great Westmore makeup dynasty, but he really was in admin duties. And that's part of the reason why he hired Millicent was that so she could do uh, design work, designing both beauty makeups, but also alien makeup, monster makeups. And, but back then there was no IMDB. There was no 10 minute end crawl at the end of a movie. There was just, you know, the heads of production were the only ones who got credit. So Bud Westmore, you know, got to take credit for, and not just for Millicent's work, but everyone else in the shop, the, the mold makers, the sculptors ex- until now. And he said, whoa, 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 that's not okay especially you can't send a woman out to do that. So he pitched a fit, talked to the publicity people at Universal and said, okay, we can do this, but only if we, as we would call rebrand, you have to rebrand the tour. And so she went from the beauty who created the beast to the beauty who lived with the beast. So she went from, I designed this to, I am his like roommate slash babysitter in some way. She got demoted to this like weird maternal role and she agreed. She's like, okay, I'll do that. And he said, also one more thing, you have to lie and tell people that you didn't design it. You have to tell people that I'm the one who did this. And she still said yes, went off on the tour. People loved her. But while she was on the tour, he was super, super jealous. He started following all the radio stations, all the TV stations, all the newspapers who talked to her. He was just furious, even though she was lying the entire time. She had a script that she had to read. She was chaperoned, even though this lady was almost 40 and I think there's a kid in here, so I'm not going to swear. She's a grown lady, (laughs) definitely could have handled herself, but he was so jealous. So he fired her. And by the time when she got back, she didn't have a job and she never worked behind the scenes in Hollywood ever again. And that was it. She was just this magical floating question mark. No one knew where she went. No one knew if she was still alive. No one knew where she came from. And that was all anyone knew for the longer, for decades until Thank you for the internet. Thank you, nerds. These photos from the set started appearing from people's collections. But even then, they were just like, oh, well, here's this lady working on the monster suit. We don't know really what her deal is or where she came from. And so she was this mystery. So cut to many years later, I became a horror filmmaker myself, thanks in part to Millicent. And she was a talisman for me, really. Every time I dealt with some hot garbage from somebody on on set or some person that was awful to me, she was reminding me that, no, 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 I belong here. I have every right to make monsters. I have every right to tell stories. I have every right to tell art. So I got a tattoo of her. Like I, you might notice I do of many things. And, uh, when you get a tattoo of someone, you sort of become like a kiosk of information about them. But the only problem is with Millicent, I really didn't have anything to give anybody. You know, I just said, she designed the creature from the black lagoon, dot, 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 dot. And she was just, again, this mystery. So a few weeks after I got the tattoo, I was at a party in New York city where I lived at the time. And I was in a conversation with a literary agent friend of mine. And he said, Oh, I saw on Facebook, you got this tattoo. Who is she? And I gave him my little tiny spiel. And he said, that would make a great book. And I laughed and he said, no, that would make a great book. Uh, so I spent the next year of my life researching her, uh, spent all of my savings, moved to Los Angeles, completely changed my life. And I finally found everything that happened to her. And that is what this book is. And while I was writing it, as some of you know, this is not a normal biography. It's also part memoir. And the reason why I did that is I think that every nerd needs at least one normal person in their life to kind of balance them out a little bit. And my normal friend is my friend named Kate. And while I was working on it, she said, okay, cool, Mallory why would I want to read this book if I don't care about Creature from the Black Lagoon? And the first words out of my mouth were, oh, because what happened to Millicent Patrick is still happening right now. And she said, you should probably put that in the book. So I started, the best way I knew how to do that was to give some of my own stories from working as a filmmaker, people who had harassed me, people who who had talked down to me and prevented me from doing my job and were generally garbage people. And it sort of really started to flow that way. And I feel very close to Millicent. We have a a lot of parallels in our life. So I started to make it this twin narrative. And then I started including parts of my detective work because what better way to illustrate how devastating the effects of that one decision of Bud Westmore than that created decades and decades of nobody knowing who this woman was than, than me showing how difficult it was to find her 
you know, right from the beginning, I got so much pushback from male historians and male filmmakers who said, oh, no, no, she must have been somebody's girlfriend. She was just a hot chick, as if that's like a position that you have on a set like this. Oh, yeah, that's our resident hot chick. She's just like walking around, hanging out. I don't know why people think that. Or they, they had all, they like were, you know, jumping through hoops to make excuses for why this woman couldn't have, like, she was literally, the picture is literally just her doing her job. And people were just jumping through hoops to claim that that was not what was the case. So, um, sorry, I get really mad about this. I have to calm myself down a little bit. Uh, (laughs) uh, So what better way to illustrate that than to put those words from the historians and to put all of my detective work in there. And it kind of became what it is now, which is like Julie and Julia for weirdos. And, and it really flowed. uh, And that, you know, I filled it with my, sense of humor, my weird jokes and my footnotes, uh, because a lot of this stuff, sexism isn't fun to talk about. You know, this isn't like, I, I knew this wasn't going to be like a feel good book. So I, I did it in the way that I do when I talk to my best friends, you know, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. So I had to make jokes and I had to also, a lot of this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so much of this sexism is allowed to perpetuate because we don't call it out and we don't look at it as it is. So I wanted to, while I was writing this, like be like, yeah, isn't this dumb? Like, this is stupid. Let's all just take a moment to see how stupid this is to really, you know, make, like pull it out into the light. So that's what Lady from the Black Lagoon is. And now I want to open it up to questions a little bit and to, I want to, uh, I'm willing to talk about basically anything you want to ask me about my research, about her, about what it was like to write it. And I also want to point out, this is my first book. I dropped out of college. I dropped out of high school. I have no formal training. I am a filmmaker and I don't even have training in that. Uh, I just figured this out on my own. Uh, but the day that this book came out, my agent tweeted at me, my agent who I adore and would kill, take a bullet for, he said, Mallory, we've been working on this book for almost 1200 days. So if you are out there right now and you are working on art or you feel like you are not qualified to do something or you don't belong where you want to be, that is not true and you can do it. So let's open it up to questions. Hi. Oh, it is on? Okay. Do you want me to say my name? If you want. I'm Ash. Hi. 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 You're a glasser. Yes, I am. Yay. Um, Thank you for buying my book. Of course. I just bought my second copy. (gasps) You're the best. Thank you. I try. Um, So my brain is a little fried because I just spent spent this week reading 320 pages of the presidential budget. Oh my God! How are you not a puddle? I am a puddle on the inside, but what I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. I don't but, even know what year I'm in right now, so it's but fine. But what I'm trying to say is, I love research. Research is my favorite part of my job. How did you do all this research? Like that's been the thing that's just been like, how did you find all this information? So this is the portion of the event where a giant rainbow comes down, and I ride it, singing, "Get a library card," <laughs> and. I'm not joking. I owe so much to the Los Angeles Public Library, to the Hearst Castle librarians. The the amazing thing about libraries and librarians is they don't just make reading accessible to people. They make writing accessible to people. Do you know that you can just ask librarians questions and they'll answer you and they'll help you? Amazing. So after I talked to historians and filmmakers and I sort of got an idea of where like a rough outline of, you know, where things were. Um, Tom Weaver, who wrote The Creature Chronicles, pointed me to the uh, USC Cinematic Arts Library, which is very weird because it's a library for movies. It's like being in a bizarro non-book dimension. Um, and they, those librarians connected me to other librarians. And then once I figured out sort of the things that she generally worked on and like the parts of, the, of history she was in and the parts of California she was in, I just went to the library, looked up her name, uh, the seven that she went under during, during the curse of her life, which was a nightmare to research. But I just started going everywhere. I And while I was trying to find her, I was also trying to build some historical context because, again, all this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I really wanted to show, like, Millicent Patrick grew up at Hearst Castle. Her father was a man named Camille Rossi, and he was the superintendent of construction at Hearst Castle for 10 years. And William Randolph Hearst was sort of America's first media mogul. And so when I say house, I mean, like, he would be in Cribs if Cribs was back in the 1920s. It was this, like, 
massive opulent estate that actually is a state park now in uh, San Simeon, California. And so that's where she grew up. So I couldn't just be like, oh yeah, that's where Millicent grew up. I really wanted to give an idea of what that was like for her. You know, this was a place that like Charlie Chaplin hung out at. So there was like celebrities. It was this beautiful place. And like, I really wanted to show how that affected her. And I can't do that without tons and tons of research. So God, I don't even want to know. I maybe read 50 to 100 books for this book. You become sort of a wood chipper of research materials. Uh, but again, I, I just looked at the library. I really didn't buy that much. Uh, I bought a couple of books because I wanted to highlight them. And I would never do that to a library book. So, but yeah, if you're trying to find out more information about a subject or you want to write about a subject, get a library card. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan. Hi, um, Ryan. I have kind of an oddball question. I've got a read. I'm an oddball re person. I'm ready for you. Cool. Um, I know a couple of years ago, um, my friend Britt and I actually got a chance to meet Rico Browning. Awesome. Um, Your friend Britt with really good hair. Yes. That I'm obviously biased about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know if maybe you got a chance to talk to any of the surviving uh, cast or any crew from that. Maybe get they knew anything else about her by chance. No. Unfortunately, I did not get to talk to Julie Adams or Riku Browning. Especially Riku Browning doesn't remember Millicent. But remember, Millicent worked on the pre-production of this movie. So she wasn't on set very much. Uh, the, the pictures that you see of her working on the suit, the, most of those pictures come from something called the tank test where they were like, okay, cool. This looks great. Will the person inside of it die if we put them underwater? <laughs> so it was, a, they had this massive tank on the universal lot and Millicent was there working on it and painting it and making sure it looked the right way um, on regular camera and also underwater camera. So she didn't really interact with the actors too much. So it was more important for me to talk to historians who talked to people who worked on the film. So yeah, unfortunately I never got to talk to Julie Adams. Uh, rest in peace. She is, uh, I can't swear. She is amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Mallory, for coming. That's interesting. I saw the movie the year it came out. Wow. And, and I can tell you, we thought it was really scary. Uh, it was in a small town in North Carolina, and it really was the talk of the town, 1954, I believe. Now, my question is, uh, did Millicent just work on the design, or did she actually work on making the monster, making the costume Oh no! So Millicent was what we would call now a concept artist. She did she did work on the suit painting wise, but she was not a sculptor. She did, did not make work on molds. She her job in the makeup shop was whether it was like beauty makeup, like lipstick, facial hair, stuff like that, or like a crazy alien. She sketched out things for the sculptors to create. So she did not do any sculpting herself. Um, I have a comment and then a question. I think uh, the creature is one of the you know best creations as far as monsters. And I'm movies. again very lots it's, of bias tonight. Like yes, I <laughs> I agree. And it doesn't. It certainly doesn't get you know the amount of hoopla that Frankenstein gets and Dracula stuff like that. But my question is, um, since she was um, an artist, right? She worked for Disney, and um, she also sort of broke a few barriers in Disney, from what I understand. Like you know they didn't let women do certain things, but they let her do it. Um, where was the inspiration for the design of the creature? Is there, and was there any information when you did your research where she came up with some of the ideas for what the creature would look like? Oh yeah. So you have to remember Millicent was the second person to make the creature. The way that it worked was the first round of creature. William, William Allen, who was the producer of this movie, he wanted basically like a wet King Kong. He wanted a beauty and the beast story. So he wanted a creature that was full of empathy, was very like romantic looking. And he, instead of giving it to the makeup shop, he asked the prop department to do it. Terrible idea. So the first round of creature basically looked like, you know, those weird full body spandex onesies. It was like that, but with like a guppy head. It was, it was terrible in the way that it didn't look scary. It just looked weird. So, uh, the entire production team at universal was like, this is garbage. We can't do this. So they went back to the makeup shop and we're like, Hey, can you guys do this very quickly? So what Millicent did is she talked to William Allen and the director and Bud Westmore, and she did a lot of research into Devonian age fossils, ancient lizards, ancient, ancient fish. So when you're looking at the creature, it, 
that's, I think, one of the many reasons why he looks so great is she wanted something that, I mean, in 1954, we went from being afraid of like old world gothic monsters to being afraid of space. And this was the, you know, t ex like the sci-fi explosion at Universal and all over the every movie studio. So there was a bit of a higher suspension of disbelief because people were getting a little bit more knowledgeable about science. So she wanted something that was a little bit believable. Like back in 1954, you probably don't think vampires are real, but a half man, half fish that lives in the Amazon river could conceivably be a thing. So she did a lot of, she really went like scientific and that's why it looks the way that it does. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel. Hi and, Rachel. Uh, I'm an illustrator, so I'm <gasps> super interested in Yay. this book and everything about it. Um, my question is, when you were, I know that this book is mostly about uh, Millicent and your experiences, but while you were doing the research, did you come across more women in the industry that were overlooked and like uh, who had the similar experiences and that we'd love to know more about? Yeah, actually, someone that I didn't write too much about in the book uh, is a woman named Ginger Stanley, and she was Julie Adams' stunt double. And she did a lot of the underwater wa water swimming shots. And she, again, God, I can't swear. Uh, she was awesome. Uh, and also there was a woman who, she does get credit, um, but I, I think she should be more lauded. Uh, there, there was a woman named Julia Morgan who was the architect at Hearst Castle. And she's actually the reason uh, why Camille Rossi and the whole Rossi, because Milton Patrick's not her, her real name, her uh, birth name is Mildred Rossi and why the entire Rossi family left Hearst Castle because uh, Camille didn't like having to answer to a woman. And Julia Morgan was this incredible architect. She um, uh, she designed almost 800 buildings all over California. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger inducted her into the California Hall of Fame, which is like life goals, right? Uh, she was just incredible. Uh, there was also a woman named Nelbert Schoenard, and she was the woman who owned the art school that Millicent went to. And like just a year after women were allowed to vote, Nelbert Schoenard opened her own art school in Southern California and ran it and like made it this incredible art school. And she's the reason why Disney is the way that it is because Disney back then couldn't afford to train his animators. And he went to all the art schools all over Southern California and they all turned him down. But Nelbert Schoenard said, okay, look, I know you can't pay me right now, but we'll figure something out. And Disney, Walt Disney himself would drive all these animators in his big car down to the Schoenard Institute and get them trained up there all because of Nelbert. So that's where this Disney Schoenard Institute pipeline came. And so Disney kind of got the first pick of all the uh, artists there. And he hired Millicent himself because that's where she went to school. But it, the, throughout the entire book, there's some really, really amazing women that I think more people need to know about. I think we have one down front here. Someone with great glasses. Oh, and so many cool people here. Uh, hi. Is, is it on? Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Charlotte. And I know you. Yeah, hi. hi. <laughs> um, so Are those that, jaw yes. bones? Yes. Oh, so cool. <laughs> um, now that you have a taste for research and writing on fiction, do you have another book in you or are you going to take a break for a bit? Uh -huh. I don't take breaks. What are those? <laughs> That's crazy. I have three books that I'm working on right now. Awesome. Uh, one, they're all nonfiction. Uh, two are more adult nonfiction. One is going to be another biography, which I swore that I would never do again. I think it was, it's kind of like marriage where after this book took so much out of me emotionally, just because Millicent means so much to me. Like I cry at the end of every, t every time I've ever, I ever read it, every pass, every, even the copy edits, I cry. I'm, Millicent means so much to me. So it was really hard for me to write this book. And I was like, I'm never doing it again. It's too hard. And then two weeks after I passed in the final book, looking online because why do I why do I do why do I go on the internet and I saw this mention of a woman who worked on another classic monster movie and I'm doing that and then I'm doing another uh it's not movie related but it is very it's a feminist history of something that no one's written before and then I'm working on a YA book about filmmaking because I hate sleeping <laughs> <laughs> and I think we have someone right down front Hi. My Hi. Name's Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Yes. Or at Fudski on Twitter. We've talked before. Yay. Um, <laughs> so I have a question about uh, spoilers. When you sold your soul to the Mormons to get more information, oh, please boy. tell me more about 
that research. Thank you. Oh, that was wild. So it, <laughs> there was a lot of weird. I, so I went to many different kinds of libraries for this book. So I hit, there were a lot of times during the course of writing of this where I hit research walls, whether it's because people didn't want to talk to me or I just couldn't, I couldn't find the breadcrumbs. And a friend of mine told me, you know who you should talk to is the Mormons. And I, I spoiler alert for everyone. I was raised completely without religion and I had I was like, I, what, what is, what am I going to do? I don't like, I was like, I don't, I don't want to drive to Utah. I don't know what you mean. And she said, no, there's a Mormon temple here in Los Angeles. And I didn't realize that, uh, you know, family.com, family ancestry.com. That's all Mormon stuff there. They have sort of like the hold on genealogical research in America. So I went in there. Uh, looking like I do. <laughs> and they were very nice to me. And I gave them all of my information in exchange for access to their archives. Um, and so that, cause they have this thing where, uh, you can read in the book. It's so weird. It's this necrogamy thing where if they're a Mormon man dies on merit, they, they can, well, after he's dead, they can marry him to a, an unmarried woman somewhere in the afterlife. I don't know how it works. I think so. I think what's going to happen is when I die and when I'm in the Mormon space afterlife, some guys can come up to me and ask me if I will marry them. Totally worth it to write this book. I'll deal with that later. Uh, but it was worth it because I found everything that I needed to find. Well, not everything, but I found a lot of things. And I found, I won't spoil it for you folks, but I found the thing that completely broke this book open and made me able to write it and made it what it is. Uh, but they were super nice and I still have my logins. So I'm going to be using it for future things. Thank you, Mormons. Uh, so thank you for uh, not turning away a really weird tattooed lady <laughs> who uh, asked to come in and look at all your stuff. Is that a creature tattoo? Yeah, that's my first thing to say, yes. Uh, oh, hello? Yeah. That is so cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Um, what I wanted to know is what um, what projects did you work on for Disney? That's mm. something I've never heard anything about. Yeah, I'm I, some of some events I've said it. Some events I've I haven't because it, it is a big spoiler in the book. Uh, I will say she worked on my absolute favorite animated monster, uh, and some of the other things she worked on she animated on Dumbo. Uh, and if you've ever seen a movie called The Reluctant Dragon, it's sort of um, it's like a mix mashup of live action and animation. And she worked on that, but she also is in it. So that was her very first on-screen role. There's a scene where Robert Benchley comes in and there's a bunch of animators sketching an elephant. And Millicent is in there along with Retta Scott, who is one of the other first female animators at Disney. So I have a screenshot of it. I can I can tweet it after it, but it's really cool. And then she worked on one other big project that I won't spoil for you in it. There's a few moments on this project where I was like, ooh, this is getting spooky and weird. And uh, when I found out that she worked on this one thing, it really, like... Oh, she's the best. She's the queen. Were you able in any way through letters or anything like that to get a sense of what she was thinking and feeling? Yes. Uh, I guess I'll spoil it for you folks. I, I found her family. And that really broke everything open. Uh, and b being able to talk to her niece gave me up until that point, I had was getting a good sense of who she was as an artist and her career, but I really didn't get a sense of who she was as a person. And when I found her niece, I was able to say, well, what does she feel about this? How was she as an aunt? How was she as a family member? How was she in person? And that was really when I was able to get insights as to how she felt about the Bud Westmore thing, how she felt about her own career, how she felt about her friends and how she felt about so many things. So that then I had to go back and rewrite some things and put those feelings in there. Hi, uh, Hi, I'm Amelia. Hi. Um, so you mentioned several incidents in your own life throughout the book where people either made assumptions as mm. to who you were in your working life or that, um, you know, that you were somebody's date, girlfriend, you know, yes. got where you were be with your feminine wiles, um, trying to keep this clean. Um, have you found better ways to react to that because I run into the same thing frequently in my working life, especially when it's a 
social event tied to work where it is no longer obvious that I am one of the uh, people in my organization vice somebody's girlfriend. My favorite thing to do when you react, when, when that stuff happens is to completely turn it around on them. Uh, cause I have, I feel like when that happens to me, it's like, you know, those video games where you can have three responses and you're like, all right, do you want to be mean? Do you want to be nice? Do you want to disappear in a puff of smoke? Uh, so for me, it's always like, do I want to be sarcastic? Do I want to freak out and be mad? Or my favorite thing is to just be like, what are you talking about? And force them to say what they mean out loud because it's completely non-confrontational. And then sometimes, I mean, mm, I hate to give a pass to any of these garbage people, but sometimes they really don't even realize what they're saying is so offensive and being forced to voice it may like just watching those terrible words come out of their mouth. They're like, Oh God, I'm terrible. <laughs> but it's a really easy way for you to, to dis diffuse the situation because I mean, my response, uh, like my initial response to things is to freeze especially when I'm, there's a situ there was a moment uh, that I talk about in the book. Actually, you know what? I'll tell a story that I didn't put in the book. There's a lot of stuff that happened that has happened to me as a filmmaker that um, I didn't want this book to be depressing. So I didn't put all of my stories in there. Also, how are we on time? OK, cool. Uh, so oh, when was this? 2014, I think 2015, 2014. Um, we were on, we were at the Brooklyn Puppet Festival announcing the project that I just started developed and we were working on called Yamasong, which is in theaters now across the country. And my boss, Sultan Saeed al Darmaki, hi, told me he was like, "All right, we're going to the Brooklyn Puppet Festival to announce this big project. Why don't you host a dinner afterwards with all the filmmakers and we'll you know we'll puppet people, we'll network. It'll be great. Cool. We'll pay for it." So after the after the big announcement, after the big event, we went to a restaurant and. Um, People were, you know, are all drinking and eating food. And this very prominent director comes in. He wasn't invited. I didn't even know that he was going to be there, but he sort of came in. And I was like, oh, you know what? It's fine. Come, like, you're cool. Like, this is all networking. Yeah, sure. Come on in. And he sort of sat down at the table and positioned himself as if it was his party now. And he started introducing people and like talking to people, inviting them in. And I was already like, eh. I was like 24 at the time. And I still look the way that I do. Um, and I think my hair was bright red and I still a tattooed and all black and stuff. And so I'm always very nervous about appearing professional. And, um, so he's eventually he just got to the point where he was introducing me to people, which already was getting me mad and I was pretty upset. And then someone came in and he was like, hi, I'm so-and-so I'm a director. And this is Mallory. She's a porn star. <laughs> and I was so flabbergasted because like first what second off who the hell, who the heck do you think you are but i was so nervous about looking unprofessional and about this i had worked so hard this is the first movie that i had developed myself this is the first big event for it and i didn't want this guy to screw it up so i was just like ha it's fine ha 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 and what i wish i would have done was gone back and be like what do you mean what are you implying and just make them feel uncomfortable. Let them do their own work. They're already a garbage person. Let them let them reveal themselves. And it is. I think it helps, especially like again for people like me. I'm a very sarcastic person. I don't have a problem with with speaking my mind. But when things like that happen to you, you get such a dump of adrenaline that you never know what you're going to do in those situations. And I normally freeze and try to get the situation under control. But what I wish I had done is just made him explain himself and it's a great fallback plan and that's the way that I'd recommend doing it or like throwing them in a volcano that also is good <laughs> so we have time for another like two or three questions hi I'm Andy uh, hi on Andy Twitter you know me as Mr. Black I offered to bring cookies anyway <laughs> we'll, we'll talk later um but two questions kind of about the same thing in research. One is, since you said you dropped out of high school, dropped out of college, were unprepared, but this was an idea that was thrown at you at a party. What was it that you did to prepare to do all the research? What kind of things did you have to learn to do? And then what, out of all the things you did, do you think will help you in the next biography that you said you had planned? So the thing that I, I really learned and is I'm helping me now is, so what, what the problem was, 
future or present me was being very mean to future me. And it was the sort of thing where I was taking all these notes and for a while, all of my research just looked like a bird's nest. You know, there was notebooks everywhere and pieces of paper everywhere and they were all scribbled down. So when it came time to put it all together and especially to make my bibliography, I was like, you know, there's like coffee stains on things and cat hair everywhere. And I realized that the best thing to do from go was to write everything down in one spot, all of my resources, all the places that I took things from, put them in alphabetical order. And not only does that help me far down the line, and I'm already doing it with this new book that I'm working on, but it helped me see in the moment, what I needed to do now. I'm like, oh, well, I've already read this book. I've already read th these many types of books. I need more of this, or I need more of that. And it just sort of made, became a central hub of all my information. And I'm a very visual person. Uh, when I'm working on a project, I sort of look like a serial killer because I have like me and my partner, we, we call it the murder wall. We have a gigantic wall in our kitchen and we have po uh, post-its and index cards for all the projects we're working on, all the different stages that they're in and all the things that we're doing. So I I need to have that. And so having a list of all the books that I had already read, all the parts that I had taken from, uh, and just keeping my research straight like that really was huge. And it took me like two years to get to that. <laughs> uh, before that, it was just a jumble of a mess. And now I'm going forward. I'm like, look, I'm a professional author and I know how to do these things. <laughs> Um, a few years ago, there was a, a, a viral um, rejection letter from Walt Disney to a female animator, and he yeah. basically said, um, you know, don't apply, this is a men's only field. I was mm -hmm. just curious what changed his thinking on that and allowed Millicent to break that glass ceiling. Well, they sort of, what's interesting about Disney at the time was that, so holding that piece, it was also a really great place for female artists to work. So what a lot of people don't realize is that most of the animators at that time were men, but and to get those animators drawings as in, as a movie you had to put them onto cells and that's the shorthand for these like celluloid acetate i think it's called it's like this see through stuff and so someone needed to tr like paint and ink those scenes onto these tiny little cells that were like the size of a quarter and that every single person who did that was a woman there was a massive building called the ink and paint building that men weren't even allowed to go into and it was just full of women doing all of those things and that's where Millicent started she started in ink in painting and then worked to inking and what happened was so many of those women were just so I'm not gonna swear so freaking good that they got promoted. And what Millicent's path was she went into uh, color effects and special effects first. So the first thing she worked on animating, she was color animating. So she wasn't animating with ink and drawings. She was animating 100% with paint. And she was great at that, so she got bumped up to being an in-betweener. Uh, Retta Scott, who was the first female credited with animation on Bambi, she moved from the story department. So, I, And I think this is very... Um, indicative, it's, it, almost every system works like this, where there's not like a, hey, we need a bunch of women. Women work in these ancillary jobs and they're so freaking good at it that they're like, oh, I guess we can, guess we can bring them in here. I guess, man, okay, fine. And then they're amazing at their job and they're just so good you can't argue with them. So that's sort of how it happened. But yeah, so Disney was on one hand, great, but on the other hand, a terrible garbage person. <laughs> so it's, but it was for the time, it was a great place for women to work because they could get in through those like backdoor avenues. We have time for one more question. There's one, one out there. more. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out. Um, can we get one more round of applause for Mallory? And for you. Fabulous. Thank you, everyone. Sorry I was late. <laughs>